Hello, everyone, and welcome to United Way Live United. I'm Terry Westerfield, and joining me today, I am very excited to welcome guest from Council on Alcohol and Drug Abuse, or CADA. I want to welcome to the program Amanda Walker, who is Director of Clinical Services. Hello, Amanda. Hello. And Lindsay Prevost. Lindsay, thank you for coming back. Lindsay Prevost is the Director of Prevention Services. How are you today, Lindsay? I'm doing great, Terry. Well, this has become a tradition for us to really have someone on from CADA on board with us because it is carnival time in South Louisiana. That means fun, floats, frivolity, also beads, and often booze or even more. So for those with an alcohol or drug problem, it's not always easy to just say no. And that can lead to a myriad of problems that can escalate into binge drinking, to an overdose, and other issues. And counseling is obviously needed. And that's why our friends are here today from CADA, a council on alcohol and drug abuse. And they've been serving our community, wow, since 1960, ladies. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I tell you what, we are proud to be a, a partner of yours and a community impact partner and all the good things that you do in the community on the best uh, behest of education, prevention, and boy, you've got a full plate for a very small agency. We certainly do. Yes, ma'am. <laughs> but you do a lot. Let's talk about... We started off with Mardi Gras. I mean, here it is. We're in the thick of it. What can we do? What the people get out there? We know it's okay to have a little fun. I mean, you almost always, you see the grill, you see the cooler, everybody's got maybe, uh, you know, a few soft drinks, but there's going to be something else in there too. You can have a beer. You might have some uh, hard liquor. Who knows? I've seen the jello shots. Anything, it seems like, goes on Mardi Gras. But isn't it the old, just in moderation, really? Definitely. I think people tend to overdo it during Mardi Gras and tend to feel as though they have license to do that. Um, but it's really important that they keep track and keep note of what they're drinking, how much time has passed. And remember that other people, including children, maybe their own children, are seeing them and learning their own drinking behavior for the future from their parents and their caregivers. And I think that's it. You can let loose. It's a little bit. We know that you can. It's uh, before leaning up to Lent and everything. But it is that idea that, as you said, too much. And when is too much for somebody? We're all different. But you know that it comes, especially if we're talking alcohol, body weight, and even the difference between men and women. Mm -hmm. Correct? Yes, ma'am. And how does it? I mean, supposedly, and also size. I'm sure that petite Petite young people, such as yourselves, ladies, <laughs> you know, it, it, it's a different than if there's a big 200 and whatever pound guy and he's having a couple to drink. Is there a rule of thumb? The rule of thumb is generally um, what we hear most is one drink per hour. Um, typically, it takes your body a little time to metabolize alcohol, and that's not always a safe bet. So you just want to pace yourself as much as possible, not having more than one drink in an hour, drinking some water in between, taking some breaks. And doing those kinds of things. And I would imagine, again, whether it's too hot or too cold, it might be a little chilly this year. Uh, you know, it's, it's already a little nippy out there. But it could also be beautiful parade weather. And I think the nicer the weather, we've also seen more of the parting that takes place. Mm -hmm. And that becomes, that can be dangerous. Exactly. Sometimes people get really caught up in the, the spirit of the day and hours sort of pass quickly. And before they know it, they're about to walk back to their car and without really realizing it, about to make what could be a potentially deadly or, at the very least, incredibly costly experience um, just by not considering how much they've had to drink and that maybe they should take a cab and leave the car and pick it up tomorrow. Or look for friends or if there is a designated driver mm -hmm. or anything because you're right. that it, People may not always think they are, and I remember all the old public service announcements, and maybe we need more of those again because you would see someone taking the keys or someone, oh, I'm fine, and then you see them, they can't even stand up when they're walking. And that is, you don't always, once you have been drinking, or heaven forbid you're into something else, your brain isn't functioning. You, don't, you may not even realize that you're that bad off, correct? Yes, ma'am. Um, one of the biggest things that people don't realize about drinking is eating a quantity of food. It's New Orleans. We love to eat. And so food is very important because alcohol is mostly uh, metabolized through your small intestines. So the more food you have, the less likely you're going to have that intoxicating feeling very quickly. So it kind of helps to pace you out a little bit. So make sure you eat and drink at the same time. 
And again, you can have a good time without all the imbibing. Because I think, Lindsay, you brought up a really good point, too. Uh, Mardi Gras isn't just about beads and fill in the blank. It's about family. It's about coming together and along the parade route, multi-generational families get together and friends. And you could be setting a very bad precedent for children, especially if you see a parent or a loved one or just an older adult who's really just, you know, displaying some bad behavior. Exactly. I mean, as children, we learn how to behave from our parents when we don't even realize we're learning how to behave. Um, so we model that behavior. Um, and it's important that parents and even older siblings model responsible drinking behavior, responsible coping behavior, um, conflict resolution, all those things, because kids are watching and paying attention and mimicking. And they will internalize that and it may affect their future. And also, just speaking of children, you know, I'm from New Orleans and I remember loving Mardi Gras as a child and I wasn't drinking. Um, you know, so it's maybe thinking back to how fun it was at maybe a more innocent time sure. is a good way to remind you that it can be really, really fun, even if you're a designated driver for the day. You know, it conjures up the feelings of being a kid again and having it be all new. So it's, you could look at it that way. And I think that's a good way because we do, we have that reputation of being kind of party central. In fact, what is it? It's often you hear we're party gras and you can have a good time. You don't always have to have alcohol. Mm -hmm. And on top of that, unfortunately, we know that uh, drugs are on the rise and the drug use again is coming back. And that can be very dangerous, too. And I'm thinking on what maybe perhaps as, as the clinical director, maybe Amanda, you can talk to that. But also I'm thinking of something else that you just said, Lindsay, to play off the fact with the children and what's going on. I, you start to imbibe or perhaps you're doing something else and you've lost control. I have seen somebody just putting a foot out to step on a doubloon. Hey, we've all done it. That's part of the <laughs> custom. But the next thing you know, a fight actually erupts because someone perhaps has indulged too much. And fisticuffs are going. You know, it, it, that's just crazy. Uh, yeah. Alcohol tends to interfere with the way that we uh, kind of think clearly. It, it definitely interferes with our executive functionings, the things that tells us. It's essentially a messing with our brake system. That stuff that says stop, this is probably not a good idea and something you wouldn't usually do. But you tend to do it anyways because that part is just, it's you don't have that functioning there. And so you're more apt to respond quickly, to qu quick to anger, to get into fights, other things like that. Well, I would have moved on shortly to, to the educational component mm -hmm. of Cato that is so important, some of the many other things you do, but I've got to ask the question. Uh, what do you do or what can you do for someone if he or she has just overindulged? They, you don't know what's wrong with them or you suspect it's because they've just been drinking heavily or may have ingested something else. You find that, what do you do? What should you do along the parade route? Well, I know that there are emergency uh, first responders um, on the parade routes. Find the nearest one to you. Even if you don't know that person, you could be just the one good Samaritan that saved that person's life. Um, don't assume that they'll sleep it off or they'll it'll work itself out. You never know. That person could could be having a non-drug related cardiac event or, or anything. So just trust your gut. And if you see something that worries you that that person may be in danger, contact the nearest, you know, grab the nearest police officer, the nearest EMS worker. Um, there's lots of people that are posted all on the routes that are there for that very reason, to keep the peace and keep people healthy and safe. And I think that's a very wise, wise bit of information. Um, Lindsay, because you are the Director of Education Services, let's talk a little bit about it because maybe people wouldn't be overindulging. Maybe they wouldn't be working themselves up for all this if they understood what alcohol and what drugs can do to them. I know that you've hit a little bit upon it, Amanda, but let's talk about where you're reaching out into the schools at a much younger age than I had originally remembered. And it's unfortunate because it's necessary, isn't it? Exactly. I mean, we, we teach as young as kindergarten um, with our Too Good for Drugs curriculum. And so we go through kindergarten to high school, um, all the way and everywhere in between. And it's important to start young because um, these healthy behaviors, these healthy habits are things that are just like, a, just like math or reading or English. They're skills that you build over time, and they make you that less likely to start using alcohol and other drugs at an early age. And so if we treat it as something that needs to be revisited each year, like math or science or English, we'll be more likely to have a good outcome with our young people. And I think that's important because 
peer pressure from the time you're in those very early grades and especially going up through high school and beyond, a lot of kids, it is hard to just say no. But by reinforcing and if everyone you're trying to kind of get on the same page mm -hmm. from the beginning, I would think that it would be less likely for them to, to find having them a problem with alcohol or drugs. Exactly. It's it's important that we give kids strategies beyond just say no. You know, sometimes it means say nothing and immediately leave, depending on what's going on. It may be to reverse the pressure to say, why are you pressuring me? I thought we were friends. I thought you knew I didn't want to drink. Um, so giving them different strategies so that they can practice them and role play so that when that time comes, because it will come, they'll know exactly how they want to handle it and they'll feel confident because they've already, you know, practiced before. Do you ever find that in the schools that will children or, and teens come up to you and say, hey, I've had this happen or, or please, Miss Lindsay, what should I do? Or do they ask for advice or is it kind of one of those unspoken things that kids are sometimes, well, they're afraid to vocalize? Sometimes they do. They may come to me and, and say, well, someone I know or I've heard of someone doing this or that. Um, and, you know, we can talk about it that way. And I always remind them who their counselor or social worker is that works at the school um, and advise them to see them if they have any questions beyond that. But um, it's always encouraging to hear them say, you know, that I could use that strategy. That would make sense. Um, and I'm hoping that they do put that into practice. And I know my other team members who go out into the schools have told me that kids have told them, hey, I tried the um, broken record repeating you know, no over and over again and it worked and I'm really glad that you taught me that. So things like that are really great to hear. I was going to say that is very, very good. What about in, in, in the household and it, again, it's not uncommon and part of our culture here and, and across the country really for a world actually that uh, people might enjoy you have wine with dinner or maybe you have a cocktail, do these things again. In moderation, we're not saying you have to be a tippler, that everything has to be, oh, no, no, no drinking or anything at all. But you set the example, as you said, as an adult or a parent. And I don't know if this is something, Amanda, that you answer again, Lindsay, but how do we reach the parents? How do we reach the adults to let them know that if they have a problem, they can come and talk? They can get some counseling and find out what they need to do to, to be better at their job of parenting? Well, um, we would all, always encourage everyone. We, we're open, you know, Monday through Friday from 8.30 to 5. Our phones are operational. They can always give us a call at 504-821-CADA, which is 504-821-2232. Um, and also, if they call 211 or Violink during our business hours, those substance abuse-related referral and information calls go directly to our office. And Amanda, as a clinical director, can you talk about some of the things because do you work individually or again kind of a group setting and, and as, a, as the director for clinical services? So we have a couple of different programs that mm -hmm. we do. Um, so we do work in group settings. We work in individual settings. It just, um, it's dependent on the person and on the case. Um, one of the things that I think is very important is that we need to have more education. I think a lot of the times we kind of gloss over alcohol and drugs because it's not something that's necessarily talked about fully in our society. And I think that leads to some misconceptions about, you know, how does alcohol work? How do drugs work? What happens when you use these? And I think that's a real detriment to um you know, not just us, but our community, because we aren't understanding what's actually going to happen. And so people tend to experiment and they're curious. And I think that's human nature, right? Mm -hmm. Do you think we've become too permissive? I mean, I, I, or I know some of the big news stories that are out now. I mean, we've, they've already legalized marijuana in some of the states for medicinal purposes. Now they're talking about doing it in Louisiana, again, for medicinal purposes. But other people are saying, hey, you know, I, I went out to Colorado and uh, nothing in Colorado, but wow, I had a good time. Ha, ha, ha. Well, is it ha, ha, ha? I mean, is it a gateway or do, are there things or behaviors that one either uh, sees or can adopt that will take them down this bad road of addiction? So there's a lot of behaviors that kind of lead up to addiction. It's not necessarily how you're using the substance, but more or less your relationship with the substance. Um, if it's something that you feel like you need to have when you get up every morning, that's an, uh, that's an indicator. If it's something where you can't, you know, we've been talking about Mardi Gras. If you can't go to Mardi Gras and have fun and one sober day, then you might want to consider what, what your relationship with the drug is. There are a lot of other factors that lead up to it. It could be medical, health, social, family, 
job related, personal, all of those things kind of give us an indication of whether or not someone has a problem. Well, does everybody have, and this may sound strange, I'm not sure it's the ability or the capacity of the term, but to become addicted to a substance, whether it be drugs or alcohol, or are there certain things in your DNA that I know that sometimes are talked about that you might have a, a predisposition to having that problem? Personally, I feel there's a combination of both. Um, there are some people who are come from addicted families and they become addicted individuals themselves. There are people who come from addicted families and have no issues of addiction. There's also the community that you're involved in. If it's something that is readily available, something that is seen as, like we were talking about the legalization with marijuana, seen as it's okay, then people will tend to use it because it's not, it doesn't have it's that okay, connotation. Yeah. yeah. There it is. So it just kind of expands. You know, and, and I'm, I'm thinking about whether or not you have the personality is there is something both uh, physiological and psychological. Again, there's that behavioral component. Uh, if you're depressed or feeling down, it always seems strange that then people might go for a drink or something that's even a greater depressant. But that seems to be what happens. Mm -hmm. How does one curb that? How do you, can you, can you really kind of will yourself off or, or as you were saying earlier, Lindsay, trying to go out to something, be happy, see what you can do. And you just reiterated, Amanda, for a day without partaking of a substance. It, it, can you kind of will yourself to be happy? Can you surround yourself by the right people or do the right kind of thing to maybe shake off that need? Well, when it starts to become a need, um, and like Amanda said, you form a very close relationship with this drug, it may not be a matter of willpower. It may be that you're in an active stage of addiction and you need to seek professional help, and it will make it all the more easy for you to proceed with treatment and have a happy and successful life without necessarily feeling that need always on your back. Um, but, you know, addiction's a disease, and so it's not just about willpower. For some, it may take willpower to just break an initial habit or if you notice, hey, maybe I should cut down on the drinking. Some people can do that, but some people can't. And it's important if you feel like that's something you're having difficulty with that you seek help. And that is the key. So again, you talk, uh, you know, we can call CADA. You're there Monday through Friday. But should they, is there a specific number you gave one? But is there also a website? What is, if somebody is listening today and they say, you know what? I think I identify with some of the things that Amanda and Lindsay are saying or they think their child or just someone, a friend, a loved one, what is the first step? Is it making that call? Is it going online? Is it physically showing up at your door? What do they do? Well, I would recommend calling our number, like I, like I said, during business hours, 504-821-2232. I'm ask you to slow down for just a moment because you know right now somebody's going to grab that pen and paper. <laughs> so please give it again. It's 504-821-2232. And we also have a website, um, www.cadagno.org. That's very good. If you are, uh, I'm, I guess I'm tying this in, I'm jumping a little bit because we've all tried so hard to forget Katrina and Isaac and all the other things, the, the, the oil spill. But they have all worked on our psyche. They've affected us in maybe ways we don't even realize. I know that after, particularly Katrina, and this is the 10th year anniversary, there are already being things published people are talking about. They're a little bit worried that all the memories will come flooding back as national and international media start to focus on our area again because this is a decade now. How have we come? We want to be remembered for the good things that we've done, how we've moved forward. But for some people, this could cause a real depressive episode. What can you give them in terms of advice or what can they do? You definitely want to be proactive. If you start to notice like you're having a depressed mood throughout most of the day, you may want to talk to a family member or a friend. Um, if it starts to get to where you're staying in the bed all day, um, not getting involved in your daily activities, work, school, whatever it is that you need to do, then those are the kind of the indicators that you might want to talk to somebody and reach out to a professional. But how do you do? Some people, I think, and I, you know, no names here, but know of some people that particularly after Katrina and then the oil spill, the kind of one-two punch that we all suffered, would say, well, oh, I went home and I just needed a glass of wine to unwind. But then at the end of the night, she realized she'd polished off an entire bottle. She said, well, I, I wasn't drunk. I, I don't, I'm, I don't, I'm not a drunk. I don't, I just, I drink a little to relax. But then if you keep that up over and over and over, that is part of that addictive behavior, right? You're just not recognizing or acknowledging that you need help. Yeah, definitely. I think, you know, everything has to start somewhere. And like you said, if someone is 
before they realize having polishing off a whole bottle of wine and this is going on repeatedly that the reason they don't think they feel drunk is because they've built up tolerance and if this continues to go on they will continue to drink more and drink more to need, you know to fulfill that need and so it kind of swings out of control before they realize it so it's important to put the brakes on it as early as possible if you start to notice that you're increasing your use and you know you need to make a conscious effort to count literally count the drinks pay attention to to what you're doing and you know it'll give you an early on chance to curb things but again if you feel like i can't get a handle on this it's really important to reach out for help does it make you weak at all it makes you really strong to have the courage to call and ask for help and we'd be happy to take your call and that's important but i also think of something else what about the the party people or the weekend drinkers who say i do not have a problem i don't drink at all during the weekend but then on the weekend the next thing you know or on during the week but on the weekend they've gone out maybe they've gone out to dinner maybe they've gone to a party and the guy says well it, it was only a six pack or maybe it was more but they do this on a continuum that's binge drinking and that can be very dangerous as well you get in some real problems there health wise and Definitely. again i guess the, the driving and everything else right yeah Binge drinking is typically drinking, um, for men, it's five or more drinks in a four-hour period. And for women, it's four or more drinks in a four-hour period. Uh, <clears throat> that doesn't really sound like that much. It's not that much. By what you much. think of New Orleans standards. And then I don't want to get the city of bad rubber, our, our southeast Louisiana. Mm -hmm. But you think, oh, my gosh, during a football game or during the Super Bowl, how many people were, you know, just pouring them back, quite honestly? Right. It's real easy to drink over your limit. I think that's one of the things that we don't realize um, is that it's very fast and you can, you know, you're having a good time. You're not paying attention. And like Lindsay said, I think it's important for you to really watch your, your intake. We um, ask questions when we do assessments, you know, how often and how much do you drink? And most people go, oh, I, I don't know. Um, but it's important because it's those things that she talked about, the tolerance and all of those other things that go along with it that you have to kind of be aware of. So those are some good rules of thumb, I think, for anybody who's listening right now. Let's, let's go over them one more time. The difference between men and women, and women are more susceptible. Is that just because of usual stature, because of size? Is it hormones, kind of all of the above, or how we process it? There's a couple of different things. One of the biggest thing it comes down to is body um, weight and body water. Um, women tend to have a lot more water, so we tend to metabolize things and uh, get things out of our system a little bit faster than men do. We also have more fat, too, and that plays right. into it. And <laughs> Wait a minute. Not Don't because we're fat, here. but because we were <laughs> voluptuous and we're designed to have children. Ooh, well, all right. <laughs> so that's, that changes our sure. metabolism and tends to cause us to feel drunker quicker than a man would. But then you talk about the guys, again, they think it's okay. You could have a six-pack and, and, hey, there's something bad about this just at home watching the game. Well, that's good and it's bad. They, it's good because they're not hopefully going to get in a car right. and go drive somewhere, but if you're at home and you're just sometimes it seems i don't know if the word would be dispassionate drinking but you're just doing it while right. you're watching tv or it's watching sort of mindless game. it's like yes. eating a bag of chips exactly yeah. in front of the tv and the next thing you know boom it's gone and alcohol has a cumulative effect on your body so even though you're drinking safely at home if you're you know heavily drinking even if you may not necessarily meet addiction criteria clinically you're still having a, a taking a toll on your body on your heart on your liver on your entire body so it's important to remember that you want to not exceed you know I, I believe it's eight drinks I can't remember exactly um eight drinks for women a week seven drinks seven drinks, seven drinks. And, and again that's yeah. and you think about that oh, well that's one a night and that's mm -hmm. it but we forget something especially if they taste good and, and being a woman and you're thinking about some of those yummy drinks that kind of like a fruit punch and they're great and you're just kind of having a few and then you stand up and wow you are punchy so you mm -hmm. do you have to be careful <laughs> it can sneak up on you mm -hmm. definitely unbelievable that that uh, the dangers that are there well i think this comes back then to you again lindsay because it's about prevention 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 and education and that's where it all starts and you said earlier it's in the schools but it's in the home and, and it's kind of everywhere I, I, anybody who goes out uh you never know who's watching and who you want to be I'm not going to say a role model. Some people don't like to hear that. But small children can get big ideas. Exactly. I, I mean, prevention works best when it's a partnership between the school, the home, and the community. So we want to all do our part 
just to not necessarily take responsibility for everyone else, but to take responsibility for our role in the world that we live. Um, and that starts with how we talk to our children at home about alcohol and other drugs and not pretending like it's something that we just don't talk about. It's something private. Um, it needs to be talked about, just like any other important issue. And I, you know, I hope that schools would be increasingly more open to invite prevention providers like CADA into their schools to work with their kids because it's something that is it's a fact of life it's a reality that everyone will face at some point and it's important to talk about it as early as possible I know that we did uh, primarily speak about alcohol but mentioned a little bit of marijuana and the discussion whether or not it is a gateway but also I know that in the last couple of years uh, again articles and things we've seen in the news that heroin things that are really hard drugs that you did you not think of that are back but they are and can be with a vengeance so is that something we also need to be aware of and i would imagine amanda what that can do to someone's body and that's a true addiction that once it has hold of you it's very tough to fight yeah, heroin's a very physical addiction. Um, so once you start, it's kind of like your body gets used to having it. And if you don't have it, you go into withdrawals. The, the same instance happens with tolerance, too. Once you start taking a certain amount, you need more and more of it to feel those effects. And that's where it becomes dangerous because your body can only realistically take so much at one time. And one of the problems that we have right now is people who are either going into uh, a period of abstinence and then coming back out and mm. using again and relapsing. Um, and that oftentimes leads to some fatal overdoses because your body's not used to that amount that you were taken before. Mm. Well, I know, again, please, we cannot say the name off enough. CADA, Council on Alcohol and Drug Abuse. The phone number, please, if you'll give that again, Lindsay. Sure, it's 504-821-2232. And the website, please. CADAGNO.org. Very simple. Ladies, we just have a few minutes left. I wonder if you could each take a couple minutes and what you want listeners to take away today and what they most need to know to help themselves, to help the community, and where they can go. And we know that's Kata. Well, I would just like to say that I hope that parents, families, older brothers, older sisters, aunts, uncles, everyone model responsible and safe drinking if you choose to drink. And if you don't choose to drink, then you know, hold yourself accountable to that. If you plan not to drink, don't, you know, uh, go back on your promise. Um, and even so, have that extra stash of 20 bucks for cab fare. And many of the cabs now accept credit cards and debit cards, so that's helpful too um, as an alternative. Utilize streetcars, public transportation, or just, you know, have a friend that you know is totally reliable for being the designated driver. Um, and just be careful, be safe, have fun, but always keep in the back of your mind that you want to make sure that you enjoy the carnival season without any negative consequences, without any jail time, and to just continue to talk about um, alcohol and other drugs as part of your small family discussions. You know, if you see something on television, talk about it with your kids. Have those little moments where you feel like you can impart some knowledge. And is it, you may save a life, yours and someone else's. That's correct. And Amanda, please, because I know that you see a lot too, and deal directly with clients. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I agree with Lindsay. I think communication is the key. And actually, you know, just like we, we've been talking about watching yourself, paying attention to what you're, you know, how much you're intaking and um, how that may affect yourself, everybody else around you. Um, I agree with Lindsay. We should definitely have that extra money in your pocket, the cab fare, public transportation, um, even calling a friend because it's different to call a friend when you're standing on a street corner opposed to calling a friend when you're sitting in jail um, after a DWI or an accident or something like that that could be more serious. And again, you're talking about food is important and water as well, how to pace yourself? Yes, ma'am. Definitely pace yourself, drink lots of water, eat a lot of food. It's We have great food. Why wouldn't you want to do that? I think that's correct. <laughs> I tell you what. Ladies, it, it, it's been wonderful. Thank you for joining us. And everybody who listened today, again, Kata, the Council on Alcohol and Drug Abuse, Amanda Walker, the Director of Clinical Services, Lindsay Prevost, who's the Director of Prevention Services, and Kata, again, Council on Alcohol and Drug Abuse, has been serving our community since 1960. They're one of United Way of Southeast Louisiana's Community Impact Partners, or partner agencies. And for United Way today, I want to thank you again for joining us. I'm Terry Westerfield, and ladies, can you join me? Live, Live United! United.